Welcome to Kambali 2020, a Rebuild Bali festival. Our digital program is designed to inspire and reconnect and revitalize the Balinese and Indonesian community from 29th of October until 8th of November 2020. Kambali in Indonesian means return or comeback, and it represents the revitalization in the face of global challenges. The festival will unite people in Bali and Indonesia with an international audience at a time when travel is largely impossible and creating connections is more important than ever before. Today, I'm very excited to be presenting Maya Sutoro Ng, who is the author of the best-selling children's book, Ladder to the Moon, and is currently writing a young adult novel, Yellow Wood. She is a consultant for the Obama Foundation's leaders, Asia Pacific and Girls Opportunity Alliance, and is the former director of the Matsunaga Institute for Peace and Conflict Resolution at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where she continues to teach today. She's the co-founder of the nonprofit Seeds of Peace and the Institute for Climate and Peace, as well as the Peace Studio. Maya is also the Indonesian American maternal half sister of the former United States President Barack Obama. Welcome, Maya, to our session today. Thank you so much, Janet, and all of uh, the individuals responsible for putting together the Ubud Writers Festival. What a beautiful and powerful way to connect. Yeah, very excited to be finally meeting you. So. First off, uh, I'd like to find out a bit more about you. So can you tell us about your early life? You were born in Jakarta. And so how long did you live there? I lived in Jakarta um, just for the first few years of life. And then much of my um, uh, time in Indonesia was also spent in Jogja and in Semarang. Um, I returned to Jakarta for uh, two years of middle school and then at the age of 14 went to Hawaii. Um, throughout um, my late teens and uh, 20s, I did return to Indonesia to visit uh, my mother and spent uh, lots of uh, time in um, in uh, basically um, places of dance and uh, at the Kraton uh, and studying a little bit of gamelan and wayang and kind of reconnecting through the temple motifs and um, the stories with um, the culture of my birth. But um, I haven't really lived in Indonesia uh, since um, the age of 14 beyond those summers and, and uh, visits to, to yeah wow so you were in Samarang and Jogja which are fantastic culinary centers I mean part of your early childhood memories surely must also be around the food yeah definitely all of the spices and textures and tastes of uh, Indonesia continue to speak to me most vibrantly today and I have to say if there is anybody listening um, who is willing to come and open an Indonesian restaurant in Hawaii. Hey, I will. <laughs> uh, we have a dearth of options here. And um, it's true that one really never gets over uh, one's first culinary loves. And so um, Indonesian food is food that I can eat every day of my life, um, except for the fact that it's not uh, abundantly available here. I think that there is present in Indonesian food the complexity of the culture itself. Um, you know, the, the spice and the sweetness speaks to that uh, glorious um, uh, cultural balance, the, the strength of the people and um, uh, that reverence for um, ancestral wisdom and the spices of history. And it is really gorgeous and, and uh, delightful. Yeah, it's true. I agree. I agree. Um, you were telling me that uh, you learned to speak Spanish because uh, I guess when you moved to Hawaii, uh, people thought you were Latino. I think uh, same with my children. When you're from a mixed marriage, you could be some sort of global citizen from uh, 
anywhere in the world. Um, what was it like for you straddling two cultures? Uh, well, I believe it lent itself to flexibility and, and adaptability and enabled me to uh, be a better listener and a uh, more effective peace builder. We can unburden ourselves from hate and, and embrace understanding and lean into our discomfort to reach out to people um, with greater ease. Perhaps when we uh, straddle more than one world, there's a sense of uh, in Indonesia of being um, a family, right? Extended, everyone is home and tanta and uh, they and papa and, and, uh, and, and we have the same thing in Hawaii that, uh, you know, that sense of ohana. We um, see everyone as our aunties, our uncles and our cousins and just like the black community too. And what does this really mean, I suppose? But you know, how do we act upon that familial responsibility is a question that I believe that we all ask ourselves when we are hybrids. This notion that um, we can have a strength-based approach is something that I think is true of many of us where we can layer in more than one culture flavor scent conversation and interaction and relationships and experience enrich us. And we don't have to discard anything. And uh, I think it's easier for us to uh, care for others, perhaps, rather than simply feeling badly for them, true empathy rather than sympathy. And um, I think that uh, helps us um, to carry our homes with us wherever we go. That's a nice point. I love that sympathy versus empathy. I remember um, Amitav Gosh saying that in one of his interviews here that uh, mixed children or of the third generation or the third mm -hmm. culture um, are very important for the planet, for the, the well-being mm -hmm. of, of the world. Um, and I thought that's a, a lovely way to look at it. Um, I agree, it's important. So um, let's get to your lovely book, your child's or children's book called Ladder to the Moon. Um, you were saying how as a teenager, your mother used to wake you up in the middle of the night um, to come and look at the moon. Um, I guess this was the inspiration for this beautiful story. Yes, it was. It was born um, actually during my pregnancy uh, when I was carrying my eldest daughter, Suhela. Her name means the glow around the moon. And we came across all of these beautiful children's books that were stories that mom had read to me when I was a child. And I, um, was grateful since she had died nine years earlier to have them, to be able to share them with Suhela. But I also realized that I wanted to share with Suhela and my daughter Savita, who's younger, um, the stories that were instructive, the lessons that mom would have taught the girls had she been around and available to do so. Uh, stories about growing beyond our own uh, flesh and self-interest, about our uh, intersectionality, our mutual responsibility. Um, this uh, book is really about seeing things from multiple perspectives. So the first page will um, show the earth from the moon's perspective and the final is the moon from the earth's, I believe. And it is about uh, people finding um, shared space and a uh, sense of ongoing curiosity and wonder. Suhela, all by herself at a certain point, reaches down and lifts up uh, the great grandmother who was once um, stooped and straightens herself to climb up to the moon. And in that moment, Suhela realizes her own strength, uh, that, that she will never abandon her, her community. Um, we are born sometimes with a very narrow a set of umbilical stories. And I feel that um, this book is trying to help uh, young people consider um, the value of having many stories and accessing um, truth from multiple perspectives. And this whole idea of taking a journey um, uh, and that journey is deepened um, with, with love and that sense of 
uh, wonder about uh, others and um, the courage that uh, is represented in the book of, of traveling to the moon um, is I think something that we have to think about in our own lives and certainly in this time, courage is no longer just about taking a, a single leap, but it's about journeying great distances, not knowing necessarily where we're going to land or how we're going to get back. Um, courage is about reaching out and being in touch sometimes with the sorrow of others and finding our way out of anger or grief to resilience and growth. So I hope that the book shares many of those messages. I mean, um, heroic journeys uh, are obviously a part of your whole, um, or everything that you're doing is about the story or the storytelling, the heroic journeys, um, and also the importance of love. And you feel that very much through the story, through the book. Um, and I guess that's something you carry with you in life, yeah? How at the end of the day, love um, is what dissolves borders, yeah? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and I, yep. yes, please continue. No, no, you go, you go. <laughs> no, I was going to say that's one thing that mom was very good at was sort of uh, uh, clearly, expressively, and unabashedly expressing her love and recognizing that that uh, is where we find our strength. Um, and, um, you know, how can we labor for justice when we feel hopeless? Um, but when you love, you are infused um, with a, a sense of hopefulness. Um, we can see others and then bring them closer. Uh, we see conflicts, we build bridges, we can counter mm. destruction with um, constructive forces. And this sort of this, uh, Valerie Cower, I believe is her name, wrote a book about revolutionary love, right? Um, and <laughs> how we can grieve and fight, but also build solidarity and listen and reimagine and lean in. And mom was very good at thinking about how to pay attention to the story in front of us uh, and, um, and act um, in very local ways so that we're not overwhelmed by grief and so that we can um, continue to use love to solve or heal or, um, or act in positive um, peace building mm -hmm. ways. So, so tell us a bit about your mother. I mean, she was quite a pioneer uh, living in Indonesia when she did um, having you there. I mean, to even for a, a Westerner back then to have a baby in Indonesia, um, you know, she was obviously quite fearless and driven. And you said a storyteller, um, compassionate. Um, tell us a bit about her too. Well, she was a... Um perfectly imperfect person who was very enamored of life. She died too young, especially because she loved uh, the world and all its people mm. so much. When she uh, was ill and knew yeah. that she didn't have long, she said, I thought I would want to be buried atop a hill so that you could come and read poetry to me and share stories of your children and theirs. But she said, I think you must put me in the ocean because how else am I going to get to all of the people and the places that I love so much? Yeah. And uh, she loved Bali very much, by the way. She <laughs> spent a lot of time there. Um, wow. She had romantic and uh, friendly relations with many people. Um, you know, th they're uh, not, not the romantic part, but the friendships. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but she did have a, one great romance there. She was in part, I think, um, someone who held deep reverence for the Balinese attention to detail, as well as uh, the humility of the people. Um, she built trust um, through knowing people's names and stories. Uh, by profession, she was a cultural anthropologist, but her anthropology was always applied and she always considered all of the ways of uh, well-being economic and social and environmental and spiritual um the multiple ways of of being and and uh, the roundedness of the human experience the many refractions of possibility 
she was curious. Um, she was a servant leader and, and felt a great connection with um, people from so many places and was able to bring in um, the stories and the spirituality and the, uh, the wisdom and, and uh, literature of so many different cultures, embracing um, them all, I think, with equal fervor. <laughs> I would have loved to have met her. I think she sounds amazing. Um, and uh, in 2009, uh, in 2009, you helped bring your mother's dissertation to publication in the form of the book Surviving Against the Odds, Village Industry in Indonesia, something that's also very close to my heart. Can you tell us a bit about that and uh, the process in getting it published and launched, how that was for you? Yeah, so she, she did, as I say, die far too early. She was only 52, as was my father. And she really, um, I think, took time working for Ford Foundation, Bank Rakyat Indonesia, um, and other organizations to um, engage in microfinance work and to expand cottage industries and rural credit programs all over. Um, and that meant that her dissertation took a long time to be birthed, and, uh, <laughs> and she didn't... Uh, finish it until just a couple of years before her death. And so for me, this was uh, an effort to get her work, which I felt to be quite pioneering um, into the hands of others at a time when so many people were focused on wet rice cultivation and urbanization. She really saw um, you know, cottage industries as the means by which Indonesia would retain its vitality and its spirit and the health of the people and communities she felt could be aided um, with these uh, projects and programs that would enable especially women to have control over um, their, their lives and to have greater choice for their family and community. Which is really interesting because it, it's sort of coming back to that now uh, with COVID um, and also, I mean, especially in Bali, we're seeing a lot of cottage industries being revived, um, young women weaving. Uh, I, I'm really blown away by these initiatives. So um, I think what, yeah, again, she was a pioneer ahead of her time, um, pushing that kind of cottage industry um, theory forward. Um, so, yeah, I must read the book. <laughs> um, so tell us about all the other things you do. Um, you co-founded the nonprofit Seeds of Peace, um, which connects families, community leaders, and educators. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, we um, are endeavoring to build these bridges in support of youth. Uh, we um, ensure that there is greater communication, capacity for collaboration, we have an open source toolkit and we facilitate over the course of several months a process of um, imagining the harvest, uh, preparing the soil, planting the seeds and nurturing to sustain. Um, these cohorts of family community and educators begin to work together, at, but also uh, understand the, the great uh, bounty um, that is found in their own backyards. Uh, and uh, they, uh, become emboldened to um, engage in servant and service leadership uh, in an ongoing way and to nurture that in their own uh, families and communities. We have a youth program called the Youth Talk Back and Girls Talk Back. And uh, mm -hmm. the idea is to revise our understanding of peace building, to see it as action oriented, pragmatic, and part of the daily work and endeavor of all. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, you also co-founded the not-for-profit Institute for Climate and Peace. Um, gosh, so it's about climate justice and uh, climate change. Um, again, can you tell us a bit about that one too? Yes, Certainly. <laughs> well, climate change is a threat multiplier. And so um, we do find that um, communities that are struggling with conflict um, are much more vulnerable. Communities that include uh, collaboration and uh, shared uh, 
um, resources and a deeper understanding and ongoing dialogue are better prepared uh, to meet the challenges of climate change. They are more resilient. Um, we look at that intersection of uh, climate change and positive peace building and conflict transformation through education about climate change and other informative sessions, um, community source solution building and uh, collaborative dialogues between different um, groups um, and stakeholders, as well as through work to impact policy. So ICP is the Institute for Climate and Peace, but it's also um, information, collaboration and policy transformation. I see. You, um, you're also involved in the Peace Studio, so that's another um, not-for-profit, yeah? It is. It is my third non-profit, and it is, <laughs> um, it is housed primarily in New York, although um, its members and board and supporters are all over the world, um, and it works to um, identify support and nurture creatives and storytellers and journalists uh, um, to rediscover uh, um, the uh, strength-based storytelling that can give us um, a greater sense of um, possibility and uh, to diminish hopelessness. Uh, and um, the idea here, there are many peace builders all around the world whose stories have not been told. And through um, uh, arts and journalism and other kinds of storytelling, we can reach one another uh, through music, poetry, painting, dancing, writing. We can learn to empathize. We can uh, deepen our uh, wisdom. We can change our hearts. Um, and we can take um, a world that is bruised and bleeding and mm -hmm. infuse it with new light. Um, and so we just had our hundred offerings of peace during this time. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a lot of call and need for um, visions of, of, of beauty and, and tenderness and wonder and courage. And so we had a hundred offerings. Uh, we're not quite done actually, but uh, it's <laughs> ongoing. <valley. laughs> and we also have um, uh, done uh, peace summits and intergenerational duets and um, continue to um, mm -hmm. think of arts as a, a powerful and, and transformative tool. Fantastic. Uh, so, I mean, you're working a lot with young people. Are there, have you found amongst those that you have been in te teaching or engaged with, are there any potential peace leaders amongst all these people you're dealing with? Yes, I do love to um, teach at the Peace Institute at the University of Hawaii. I've been a teacher at the middle high school and uh, undergraduate and graduate levels for 25 years. A lot of what we do is remind students that um, they need to participate in public life, which is not the same as political life, um, but mm -hmm. it's about um, helping young people to uh, choose to participate. Young people and this generation um, fill me with uh, hope because they are intersectional, they're inclusive, they're sometimes social media obsessed and missing cultural context, but they are really important creative partners and innovators. They're courageous. They have a lot of tools and strategies and knowledge that uh, we don't have, um, and they're less frequently trapped in systems um, that are binding. Uh, they are sometimes um, narcissistic, but I find more often uh, they are generous and determined to uh, embrace and to see what's possible in terms of connection and, and others. And uh, I do worry about how this time will impact them. Um, they must be on a roller coaster of feeling and yeah, feeling true. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. that of circumstances yeah, that they didn't create. Um, but I do believe that um, they will emerge from this storm um, stronger and um, they will grow and hopefully find 
uh, faster than we did, a sense of <laughs> happiness and serenity and purpose uh, that true, is true. not dependent on external situation, but is inherent in their yeah. being. So, so what are your general thoughts about this generation? You're obviously dealing a lot with young people and your own children. Um, and I guess being in Hawaii, they're uh, maybe more akin to Indonesians. I don't know, but, uh, you know, what, what do you think uh, about young kids at this point? Well, again, I think that they understand interconnectedness, that they understand that they have to invite um, more perspectives into the room. Mm -hmm. I think that they're not as narrow-minded as prior generations. I think that it's difficult for them to ascertain um, what information mm -hmm. on the internet is meaningful and true and, and wise and healthy. And uh, so we should help them possible with that and offer mentoring and support and and love and tenderness that will enable them to um, utilize their strengths and um, take um, that youthful courage and um, use it in really productive ways. I think about the young people, for instance, who are climate activists and they have done an amazing job of calling attention to our shared plight. They have helped us to understand the urgency uh, of this time and our situation uh, and what we can help through intergenerational duet, through mentorship, through, um, through the tenderness that we feel for them. Uh, mm -hmm. What we can help them do is perhaps um, take some of that frustration, uh, that anger, that that energy, that artistry, that movement building that they've engaged in, and then scaffold it with uh, policy work and um, invention and um, mitigation and adaptation uh, uh, tools and yeah. uh, strategies and. So my point is that um, perhaps every generation has its strengths. Mm -hmm. I think yes. it's wonderful, you know, yeah. that we are now understanding the importance of working together yeah, uh, respectfully yeah. and thoughtfully and including yeah. young people, not simply uh, doing things for them, but with mm -hmm. them. And um, so on the subject of peace heroes, who are your own personal peace heroes? Who is it that you look up to or, yeah, your favorites? Well, I think, you know, everyone loves Gandhi, King and Mandela because of their capacity to take philosophy um, that is seemingly soft and strategies that are nonviolent and use them with great persistence and courage to transform uh, the world and to, as I like to say, round the edges uh -huh, yeah. of yeah. suffering and injustice. But I also really like Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, lately, I've been thinking a lot about his philosophy of interbeing and um, this notion of practicing um, non-attachment to our views in recognition that sustained dialogue will enrich us and that uh, we have great beauty in our own traditions, but we can learn so much from others. And, and uh, we have to be both um, aware of the negative and positive aspects of our own traditions and uh, the strength and possibility inherent in others, uh, the richness and diversity of other traditions. I think that that's an important part of interbeing. And I love- Actually, I was thinking um, for you also spending time in Indonesia where um, there are different, 
Yeah. Um, yeah, I was thinking, it just made me think how in Indonesia, uh, when you were living uh, there uh, in, a, in a place where the faith might not be one that you were following, but just being exposed to that and other faiths as well, um, that must yeah. have surely had an impact on you. It had a very powerful impact on me. And mm. I was raised in a syncretic household and community. And I would watch as a child, uh, Sultan Hamanku Buono giving um, offerings to Nyai Loro Kidul at Parangriti. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, would see um, uh, Muslim leaders um, speaking about the importance of being caretakers of Hindu temples and I think that that was for me normalized in a way that enabled me to move through so many different communities with wonder and without fear and um, to um, feel this sense of um, rigorous uh, spiritual diversity yeah. as mm. something positive and yeah. powerfully enriching and not weakening to mm. any of the fantastic. Mm. fantastic so um you've talked about the beauty in the expression of art and um yeah faith and artistry in communities so how important for you is it that these the artistic skills uh, stay alive well bali is the <laughs> ultimate yeah. uh place for artists of course there is so much uh, uh, beauty that is found in, in the smallest of corners there. And I think that um, art is incredibly powerful. It ignites political change, invites people to think. Uh, it can create uh, small or large revolutionary shifts in perspective. It reminds us not to give up uh, because the world is beautiful and there are things to um, behold and enjoy. It allows us to take refuge in more than um, our current circumstances and um, it deepens our sense of meaning and purpose and, and I think um, helps us to care. And so um, there is perhaps nothing more important than, um, than the arts. And, and I, of course, think of uh, storytelling, writing and, and reading and oral history as being mm -hmm. uh, central yeah. components of that. And that's one of the things that you are, um, of course, helping to support with your festival. And I think of the culinary arts as being yes. uh -huh. um, yeah. so mm -hmm. a vital part yeah. of that. We literally yeah. nourish ourselves. Um, <laughs> yeah, true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so moving on to, um, well, it's election time for you, uh, I guess, in the States. Uh, so um, you assisted Obama's presidency campaign in 2007. Um, so, so what were your duties at that time? Mostly I was a surrogate uh, at places where he could not go, um, helping to share his um, personal and familial story. I went to a lot of gas station cafes and school libraries and cafeterias and uh, spent time in a lot of swing states. I also did a lot of work to try to um, appeal to educators and to Asian American communities and um, felt that um, I was successful in kind of building bridges, helping uh, also to uh, connect um, people who were um, wanting to engage um, in the civic process um, to opportunities beyond voting and to consider what it means to be part uh, of a country, to be a citizen um, and to participate in ways that uh, really contribute to 
um, a, a beautiful community and, and deep belonging. Um, so what about you? Did you ever consider going into politics? I mean, if you had any questions, I guess you could ask your brother, but you know, like, was that ever a, uh, something you planned to do? No, never. <laughs> I have never considered it, not even for a moment. Um, and I never will. But yeah. I think that everyone has their own point of entry. Um, mm -hmm. And I prefer to lead from behind, beside, beneath, I'm so grateful that my brother um, has made such a powerful and I believe benevolent impact on the world. Mm -hmm. yeah. I also think of leadership uh, as belonging very much to everyone and, um, and, and yet we, um, we all have to come to that sense of purpose uh, from different directions yeah. mm -hmm. and to occupy different vantage points and i would make a terrible politician i think you'd be um, very good <laughs> a good orator um, i mean you said of obama he's a wanderer and you said i think if he had the choice he would just set out and spend hours one one wandering do you think he's still a wanderer or is he becoming more uh I think he would like to be, but uh, the presidency unfortunately limited his capacity to wander freely. Um, and that ability hasn't really been restored because he is still so recognized and people um, don't give him really enough space for reflection and, and meandering. Um, he uses that wandering um, to reflect, to problem solve, to find strength, uh, to engage his own creativity and to listen more deeply. So I think he now is a, a wanderer of internal uh, terrain uh, as a yeah. reader, as a writer, um, mm -hmm. as a solutionary. He continues to journey, but um, it's, it, it's hard for him to um, travel in the same way, of course, uh, which is why I think he likes golf. I think the only reason is that he can actually walk uh, <laughs> undisturbed. Uh -huh. but, That's so cute. That's so cute. So, um, now, I mean, both of you, I mean, he, um, Obama is about to release his memoir, yeah, in a, in a month or two. I, you right. both you both have extraordinary um, writing skills and your speaking is like poetry. Is that something, did you grow up with poetry and a lot of literature around you? Because uh, you, the words that you speak are so beautiful. Um, yeah, it's, well, it's a skill. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> that means a lot. Just to hear all this poetry, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I did grow up with a lot of books, um, mm -hmm. with a lot of poetry and, and literature mm -hmm. of all kinds, um, sacred and secular and um, every genre. And um, those were companions and sources of great happiness. They helped these stories um, in times of trouble, allowing me to sort of embrace um, suffering or loss or loneliness uh, and transform it into understanding and compassion and joy for myself and for others. And um, so I'm very grateful to, to books, to literature, to words. Mm -hmm. I wish my Indonesian was as strong <laughs> as my English language skills, but I grew up yeah. in Indonesia at a mm -hmm. time when um, I was uh, homeschooled and then um, mm -hmm. an international school that didn't do enough to build bridges, frankly, between school and community. Mm -hmm. And um, although I spoke uh, Indonesian with, um, you know, friends in the Kampung or in uh, the Pasar or in the Warung, I still um, didn't have access to Indonesian 
literature and voices of depth and nuance and, and poetry. I regret that. Um, don't, don't worry, I regret it too. It's, <laughs> I, I always wish I had stronger Indonesian. Um, but I also, I just want to finish up by asking about the book that you're writing at the moment, Yellowwood. Um, tell us a bit about that. Yes, I'm hopeful that it will be birthed next year, but like my mother's dissertation, it just is taking its time. Um, it's uh, with my editor and publisher right now. Uh, it is a book about a young girl coming of age in a world at war. Um, her father is from one side and her mother from another. So she is forced to confront her own um, tensions uh, that are deeply internal um, part of her identity. Uh, she is um, a, a, a healer. Um, the um, book has a bit of magic. Um, she's also, um, you know, a, a, a young leader who crosses borders and endeavors to um, enter into um, a, a rebel camp to build peace and is uh, um, faced with uh, imprisonment and, and violence, but um, loosens her um, grip on fear and, and uh, finds her, her way forward. So I'm really looking forward to sharing it with your community and uh, hope you enjoy it. It brings in a lot of the uh, Hindu and Buddhist motifs from my childhood in Indonesia um, into a sort of Western narrative construction. So she is a little bit based on um, Siddhartha and, and, and her love interest is sort of based on Arjuna from the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, yes, uh, my son. <laughs> But it, it sounds like it's a little bit of your story too. I think there's a bit of a woven uh, interweaving there. Uh, yes, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Although, um, yeah, um, you know, I, I uh, I'm not sure that I um, uh, came to um, the understandings or the the experiences that she had. Um, until much later in life. Uh, the protagonist uh, is named after my youngest daughter, uh, Savita, as uh, mm -hmm. Tuhela is the name of the main character in my picture book. So I have uh, one book for each daughter. Yeah, that's nice, yeah. So um, in the introduction to your children's book, you said uh, it's the journey that matters and it's life's wondrous journey of discovery. That's what life's about. Um, so what journey are you personally on now? Well, we're all on quite an extraordinary journey, I, I think now, and we have to think about um, the roads that we turn down. Um, uh, I think that we have to be careful that we're not catastrophizing and um, that we're finding new pathways of possibility and um, leaning into our discomfort during this time of, of illness and, and fire and storm, mm -hmm. digital divide and um, political strife. Um, we are um, in a time, I guess, and, and certainly this is true of my journey where mm -hmm. uh, we are feeling a bit bruised and mm -hmm. we are in need of heroes in the most ordinary sense of that word, you know, people who can um, help us to feel courageous or to find solutions and to untangle um, our own sense of helplessness. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that we are on a journey to, to rescue ourselves from apathy, perhaps, um, and to ask better questions and finding tools and communicate 
in new ways during this time and to yeah. find uh, hope in the, the darkness. I do think that a disaster of the magnitude of the pandemic yeah, and pandemic, yeah. I think all of these other things that are layered upon that disaster, um, you know, it throws us into the present, right? That perhaps will enable us to um, let go of, uh, of, of the trivial and, and rely on our neighbors and community. And so I think we all have to think about on this journey, how do we stay in a state of, of bravery, generosity, awareness? Um, how can we do better and be better people and make this world better post COVID? Um, yes. and really learn to take care of each other. Fantastic. Well, Maya, um, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, okay. I've loved talking to you and uh, I can't wait to read your book because I love listening to, to your words. I think they're absolute poetry. So um, yeah, thank you for being part of this festival and uh, thank you for joining the program and all the very, very best. Terima kasih. Terima kasih banyak. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> for, yeah. um, Thank you. The, the connecting work that you are doing. It's been a delight. Yeah. I look forward to meeting you in person. <laughs> yeah.